Hello everyone, uh, it's four o'clock now, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to another Layers of London uh, webinar. I hope everyone's having a good week. I'm Liam Cunningham and uh, happy to welcome today, uh, welcome back, Paul McCarthy, our first ever two-time Layers of London webinar host. Uh, so he must be good. Uh, um, and he's going to tell us all about how archaeologists record stone buildings and he'll give you a, a few tips about how to uh, analyze the built environment around you. Uh, so how the session will work is that he's going to do a presentation for about 30 minutes and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end and you'll just put your questions in the chat box uh, which you can access in the menu uh, which should be at the bottom of your screen if you move your mouse around it shows up. Uh, so just type your questions in there and then I'll read them out to Paul during the Q&A. Uh, you won't need to use your camera or your microphone at all during the session. Um, and just to let you know as well that the webinar is going to be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if there's anything you want to go back over or any slides you want to see again, you will be able to. Or if there's anyone you think might be interested, uh, please do share that with them. Uh, so I think that's everything and I'll pass on over to you, Paul, now if you're ready. Hello. Off you go. Excellent. And thank you very much for having me back, first of all. And also thank you for the unexpected, he must be good, uh, to <laughs> add the pressure on right at the well, top. I know you're good. So that's why you're back. <laughs> Superb. Um, hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. Uh, well, it's nice to be able to speak to you all again. I am, of course, uh, speaking to myself in my living room. Uh, for anyone who has seen the first talk that I gave, um, there's going to be some elements of that that I'll be covering again, um, basically because there are some elements of the topic that are so important that they need to be included within this so that anyone who's new can understand what we're talking about. But I hope that I've managed to add a few new things to it so that if you are coming back, there's something for you. Um, most of those new elements will be a sort of um, a response to the situation that we've uh, all found ourselves in recent months which is being locked in our homes, uh, surrounded by the built environment uh, with not much distance to go. And I wanted to have a look at how you can use digital assets like Layers of London to be able to investigate and understand the built heritage around you, uh, including your own homes. Um, so we have the introduction and pages here, obviously. It's nice to see all of the people that we're working alongside with. And I um, work for Museum of London Archaeology. Um, what that is, is a commercial um, archaeology company uh, that also works in, does research and engagement. Um, that will become uh, important as I discuss some of the elements of why historic buildings archaeology is done in the first place. So here we go. What is standing buildings archaeology? Um, quite simply put, it is using archaeological processes to understand standing buildings. When most people think about archaeology, what they tend to be thinking about is people digging in the ground, going down layers, um, and taking off each uh, level of stratigraphy. And uh, as each layer is built on top of each other, if you remove those piece by piece, then you can record what objects you find within that, understand the interaction between the different layers, and that tells you the development and the history of the site. Standing buildings works in the same way, but it doesn't have the layers. What it has is phasing. Um, we use archaeological techniques to try and unpick how a building has been constructed in the first place, the principal build, and any subsequent developments, changes, alterations, decorations that have occurred on top of that primary build. And like stratigraphy, um, if you have something at the bottom, that's the first principle of our stratigraphy, then things that go on top of it tend to be newer. With a standing building, if you have a structure that has been built into or onto or through, that structure has to exist in the first place before anything can interact with it. So it gives you that understanding of the stratigraphic, the phasing relationship between different parts of it. So at its very core, that is what his, uh, historic standing buildings archaeology is. Um, why do we record? 
first uh, primary reason is that it's part of the planning law of the United Kingdom. Um, this all started because of a building, or rather an archaeological site uh, on the south bank of the Thames, the Rose Playhouse, which you can see here on screen. Uh, quite a detailed uh, story, but essentially the excavation was underway, they were they found the site and then there was no legal protection for archaeology. So what was going to happen is once the archaeologists were finished, flats were going to be built through it. Um, this angered uh, uh, the most powerful protest group in England, um, old white actors, and they turned up in droves to protest this, which eventually led to questions being asked in the House of Parliament as to whether this was an appropriate use of the heritage, um, and eventually the protection of the site and the creation of the first planning laws, PPG 16, which says that um, developers, if they wanted to work, uh, build on a site, uh, which may have had archaeological material on it, or now, more recently, if you wanted to redevelop a historical building, you as the developer have to pay for the work to be done. This creates the commercial archaeology world, um, as opposed to the university or research digs that uh, Mola and myself have been part of. Uh, we tender for jobs like anyone else on a building site um, or in a development. Uh, we win contracts and we fulfill those contracts by doing the archaeological work prior to the, uh, the granting of planning permission. So that is how most archaeology, about 95% of archaeology in the UK is funded and why there is this um, huge uh, amount of information that we have on these sites is because of this system um, and the way that it works. Uh, there are other reasons that you record historic buildings. Community archaeology, hopefully some of the skills I'll show you today uh, very briefly might give you an idea that you want to do some of your own work and you know work with other people as well academic studies, research digs, and personal interests. And um, there's another reason why uh, buildings, uh, well, all archaeology, but why buildings I find particularly interesting. Uh, buildings aren't a naturally occurring feature, uh, unsurprisingly. Every aspect of them is part of a choice, whether that be the material, the design, uh, the location of it, the size, the shape, the function, all of those things go into the construction of a building. And because decisions are being made and humans are having to use, uh, you know, are involved in that process, they carry with them um, political, social, um, sort of like uh, a lot of baggage comes with the construction of buildings. And I've illustrated that on screen here. These were two images that uh, I used with a, a group of younger people. And I asked them to write words to describe the two structures. And the tower block, uh, one young man in particular, tower block, he uh, wrote very negatively about, um, quite derogatory about the people who might be in it. He made assumptions about their criminality, about their social standing, about their even their immigration status, various elements of that. It was, there was a whole lot of prejudice that came just with looking at that structure. And conversely, the image on the right of the screen, the, uh, the sort of the uh, terrace house there, had much more positive connotations. It was seen as a suburban, leafy, um, something that you would want to uh, attain, you know, aspirational living. But at the very core, if you only looked at buildings in their function, both of those are domestic buildings. If you forget about all of the other contexts that buildings are recorded in, their houses. So it's important to see that even when we start discussing the material elements of it, historic standing buildings is political in its very nature because people choose to make houses and would choose to make buildings and the choices that they make add those prejudices into them or can potentially. So it's something to think about when you're doing this kind of recording work. Um, what records do we produce? all sorts of different things from historic environment surveys, uh, conservation area appraisals, conservation management plans and condition surveys. Condition surveys is um, essentially where you are trying to work out uh, what sort of, is the at one given time, uh, what condition is the building in? This is important for if you want to uh, have it listed or if you're going to do renovations on it, you need to know what you're working with. Um, 
conservation management plans fall within that as well and survey reports to discharge planning conditions as you can see is the main bulk of the work that we do at Mola. And what do we record? So if you've got past people thinking about archaeology as digging in the ground and now they're thinking about buildings, this is the kind of building that tends to come to mind. These grand stately homes, in this particular instance, Knoll House in Kent, um, one of the, uh, I believe the largest uh, stately home in the United Kingdom. Obviously, this is the kind of thing that we do do, but we also record a plethora of other kinds of buildings. For example, um, the top left there is uh, Foils on the High Street, uh, top right Draper's Hall, we have the uh, central row there of the Baptist Tabernacle in West Ham, uh, Canons Ashby, a, a grade one listed sort of a grand house next to the German gymnasium in King's Cross. And then the bottom centre, one of my favourites, because I actually got to work on it, um, that's Marshgate Lane and the glass bending factory. So you can see it runs the full gamut of uh, social hierarchy from um, industrial buildings all the way up to the sort of the National Trust, um, English heritage, that sort of that level of grade one uh, listed buildings that people might think of when they're thinking of historic structures. And what do we record? This is the list. If you wanted to screenshot something, this would be the one to go for right now. Right? This is everything that you would look at when you're going at a historic building. And I'm moving quickly through these. So um, things like form, for example, you could have a whole series of these talks just on the language being used to describe forms, architectural forms, roofs, for example, you know, I've got a poster on uh, next to my desk that has 30 odd different kinds of roof with all the individual names. We haven't got the time to cover all that. But I will cover a few elements of things that will be useful if you did want to have a look at some historic buildings. Uh, location, we've already discussed that context is important to understand uh, how a building works in its environment. Uh, buildings don't exist in a vacuum. They're <laughs> two huge revelations. They're not naturally occurring and they don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, buildings can be influenced by those around them. For example, in Muswell Hill, uh, there is a very fine cinema that was uh, built on the corner of a road, but its, it's um, entranceway was moved off the prominent corner of the road to slightly further down. And the reason it lost that prominent entrance point that you'd expect it to be at right on that apex of the road is that there was a church across the way that um, at the time of the construction of the cinema lobbied against having it pointing directly at them and so it was moved away. It doesn't seem like much but once you understand the context of other buildings some of the choices that are being made from the structure you're looking at can start to make sense in and around the environment. Um, similarly, it could also have an impact on things like uh, what materials are being used. If you're out in sort of Norf uh, Norfolk and those places, they have slightly less in the way of uh, stone deposits. So you see fewer stone houses and you see an earlier um, adoption of bricks. Um, and you know, conversely, in Yorkshire, lots of your, uh, stone available, lots of stone buildings, and they last slightly longer. So the location is an important thing to look at, and it can tell you, before you even get on site, a lot of things about it. Function, what's the building being used for, may have some specific words that you might need to use to describe that building. Materials, uh, how it, what is physically be being used. Um, the choice of material between brick, for example, or steel might tell you what kind of loads and usage the building is expected to go through. Um, if it has, for example, you know, a steel frame holding it, you'd expect it to be either a very large building or something that is expected to have quite a large load on the floors because they are, you know, the, uh, the engineering is there to support something. So it can tell you maybe what the use of the building was without it actually being you know, having to see people wander around with big pallets of things and go, ah, it's a warehouse. Like the, the, the material itself can give you some clues. Setting, <clears throat> what's nearby and all those sort of things. If there's any other archaeology that might tell you about the period. Context, um, you know, is, there, is it one terrace house in a row of terrace houses? All of a sudden, you know that this is not a very... Um, <laughs> I mean, unusual uh, structure of the locality and that you've got a lot of other examples to give you an idea of maybe this is a, a, a large uh, development of houses. Why is there a large development of houses? Is this linked to anything else? Industrial, etc, etc. 
um, phasing history in significance. So, like I say, if you want to screenshot shot anything, this is the most useful one to go for. And the recording levels that you go at change as well, which again depends on uh, what might be being done to the structure. Is, is it having a huge refurbishment, in which case you might require a higher level um, of uh, recording to sort of like mitigate for that? Or is it a more important building? Is it one of those terrace houses or is it not like a grade one listed stately home? They would require different levels of recording. Um, very simply put, basic level of visual recording is just photography. Descriptive record, uh, you write down what you can physically see in front of you. Um, an analytical record is you write it down and you try and explain why what you're seeing might have happened. So instead of saying, I see a blocked doorway, which would be a level two, you would write, there is a blocked doorway, which may have been uh, caused by the, during the construction of the extended wing to the west, um, changing the, 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 the route into the building. So you can see that the, the difference there is it, it takes it up a notch of um, trying to understand not just what the phases are, but why the phases are. And the level four is essentially writing a book. Uh, lots of uh, lots of descriptive stuff, lots of historical background, lots of context. Now we're coming to the part where I wanted to use the Layers of London asset to try and show you some of the things that you could do to understand that context of a building, to look at the history of something and just access it using digital um, assets. And the building that I chose is this one. Uh, this is 104 Highgate Hill. Uh, in my lockdown wanderings around my house, this is one of the ones that I discovered. Well, I didn't discover it, but I became aware of it and didn't know previously. It's been quite a boon to wander around and really get to know all of the area. So you can see we've got a historic structure here. Um, I know from doing some research that it was built in 1637 to 38. So I then wanted to see if we could see any developments, any usages from just using the layers of London maps. Um, the first one where I was able to locate the building was on the uh, rock map from 1746, highlighted here in red. We can already see that the structure has taken uh, form there, but it's set a little bit. Um, if you can see on this structure, uh, this picture here, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but those railings are a separate road to the main Highgate Hill. There are two roads running parallel to each other. Whereas on the map, when you compare that to the modern uh, maps with those two roads, you can actually see that it was a uh, full length and it's been split subsequently. So when it was constructed, it was directly on the road front rather than set back as it is now. So we're already starting to see something about it. Um, it it's right on the thoroughfare. Um, it's subsequent changes to the road layout that has led, meant that it's set back. So it's supposed to be right on the front, right with people passing by. It explains why it's got such an ornamental front. It's to be seen. It's right there on a major route. So that's the first thing that we have got as a kind of like contextual element to take forward if we were to record this building. The next one that it appears on is the OS maps from 1893 to 1996. Uh, uh, and here we see something very interesting. First of all, we have that building named Cromwell House, very helpful when you're trying to find it on a map. But in brackets underneath, you can just see that it is listed as a children's hospital, a use that it does not have at the moment and did not have on its original construction. So there may be elements within that building that are linked to a medical environment. Um, if you were to go and record this, this is really important information when you're walking in there, because it starts to inform your understanding of choices that might be made. Are rooms being subdivided? Are rooms being opened up to be used as wards or um, surgeries and various things like that? Do the entrance ways get changed? All of those are thoughts that you can now have approaching the building and you're already starting to get historical context for things that may have occurred to the fabric of the structure. So looking at these maps is vitally important before you go to these buildings. Um, you can also see that the road has split at this point uh, around the bank is what it's referred to and Highgate Hill. Um, it might be an element of the fact that they've put the tramway in there and they're trying to create this sort of separation between the house fronts and the trams going by. Not necessarily, but it, it's a possibility. 
also it's a real shame we've lost those trams those, those would have been much easier to get up the hill with um, and the last map I'm going to look at very quickly uh, is the bomb damage map there's no evidence around the structure that uh, it came into contact with any uh, ordnance um, it hasn't been damaged by it. The only reason I wanted to show this one is that you've got the V1 strike on there, which is the circle in Waterloo Park. And you can see those buildings nearby have suffered some damage. That's an interesting uh, point to keep in mind. If that had struck a lot closer to our structure or it had been those buildings that we were looking at, that is an important bit of evidence because it's something that has occurred to the structures that you may not necessarily have any evidence of. It's a large explosion nearby that's caused some damage that might have caused you know, renovations, repairs subsequently. And without looking at these maps, without looking at that wider context, uh, in this instance, we find out that there's no damage to our structure. But if that V1 had struck closer and there'd been repairs, this is an intangible piece of the, the history that without these maps, you would not know about. Um, this is from Google Street View to show you that the assets that you can use are widely available and you can get very close into them. You don't even have to visit these buildings to have a look at them before you go and actually record them in, in person. And it gives you an idea again of the things that you might be looking at. In this instance, there's quite a uh, ornate central window. Um, it's one of the, the more ornate elements of the building. Um, this is a, a lugged architrave. You can see those bits that are sticking out of the lugs and it's got scrolled consoles which are on the side. The reason I want to bring this up is because I'm a huge fan of bricks. I love bricks and these are an example of bricks being carved in situ. So they've already built them up on the face um, sitting uh, proud of, of the, uh, the main front and then they've carved all of this scroll work and the architrave into the actual brickwork. And I just thought it would be nice to show you that. Um, so this, as you can see, is um, it follows something called a classical architectural style or neoclassical architectural style, um, which refers to elements of um, architectural design that come from Greek and Roman sites. Um, they are uh, Andrea Palladio in Italy is credited with uh, reinvigorating the interest in that style of architecture and Inigo Jones in England is one of the first people to bring, them up, bring it over in the 17th century. And there's certain tropes within, there are two big kinds of architectural styles which have a huge impact on English architecture. They're classical and Gothic. Um, if you want to see a better example of that being explained, I would recommend getting Rice's Architectural Primer, who uh, uses those as what he calls the grammar of architecture. If you've got classical architecture and Gothic architecture in your head, you're usually able to speak on quite a lot of the uh, changes in British architecture all the way up to um, the invention of modernism uh, in the 20th century. So <clears throat> within here, we have lots of different elements of it. We've got things like so, uh, stuff that's called the rustication, which are the, uh, the, the block-like features uh, that are supposed to look like um, ashlar blocks or columns running up the face of the, the building that hold up um, what would be referred to as the uh, entablature, uh, the sort of the, the uh, moulded section above the windows on both the ground floor and first floor. Those are cornices. Uh, it's difficult for me to explain it like that, but it's much easier for me to explain it by using this building. This is St. Paul's Covent Garden, Inigo Jones, and is a beautiful example of what neoclassical uh, and classical architecture is. It has a lot of different elements that if you get them in your head, you'll be able to apply them to other structures. For example, columns. Um, and this is a, a Tuscan capital. There are four, uh, five different uh, orders of uh, column. They are uh, Tuscan, Greek Doric, Doric, Ionic and Corinthian. Uh, they all have different proportions, they all have different elements to them. We haven't got time to go into them all, but if you get those, you will find them very useful to look into all of those. Um, the entablature, the fessia, which is like a, a blank, a flat uh, plane on the front, the frieze, which is the section where you might have some of the um, uh, statutory on it, and the cornice, which is the molded element above. 
um, although this one does not have a cornice, not useful. Uh, uh, the tympanum, which is the area within the uh, pediment, uh, which again can, uh, it's where the, the, the Elgin marbles would have sat at the gable end of the, uh, uh, the Parthenon, um, and the pediment on top. These are all words, technical terms for the architecture of classical uh, um, features, and they're used in buildings throughout uh, history. For example, this early 20th century uh, row of houses, right? This is just a normal suburban house, but you can see here some of the elements that we were discussing in this one are being used in the doorway here. Um, there's the dog tooth design, which are the sort of like um, diamond shapes over the archway. Um, which is actually more of a, a gothic element. So, as I said, if you can get ideas of ca classical architecture and gothic architecture into your he head, you'll be able to explain a whole host of different elements of buildings. Um, the reason that we had this slight aside is by uh, introducing the neoclassical elements, you start to expect to see certain things. For example, the cornices, uh, the columns or things that are meant to look like columns on the front of the building and the pediments. You see here there's a pediment over those doorways. There's a missing pediment from our building and as you can see here this is an earlier drawing which shows you uh, an extreme change in the top of the building. Um, the pediment is missing from the central window. Um, a lot of the uh, detail of the uh, parapet wall just below the windows and the roof line is changed. So just by being aware that we maybe aren't seeing all of the architectural features we might expect, we can start to think mm, something's a little bit unusual. And then by looking up historical imagery as well, before we even go to the building, we start to understand that there might be something we're looking at here which in this instance is that there was a complete rebuild of the roof uh, with the introduction of the cupola and uh, various other things. Back to Google Street View, you can actually see there's even clues that you can get just sat on your sofa at home. For example, compare the brickwork of the original frontage uh, above the windows to the parapet wall, which is at the very top of the, of the image. And you can see that the bricks themselves, the material is actually different. Um, there's far more changes in colour on the parapet wall, which again suggests that there is this rebuild, redesign later on in the structure's history. So that's the kind of thing that you want to be looking for, always trying to uh, get your ahead of the game, give yourself as much information before you even get to the building so that you make your life easier when you get there. And the bottom of this image also gives you a clue as to what its current use is. Uh, anyone who knows their flags knows that that is the Ghanaian flag. And actually, this building is the Ghanaian High Commission now. Um, I'm very nearly at the end, so I'm going to move very quickly through the remains of this, just to give you a very quick hint, an idea of what other elements you might look at when you're looking at historic buildings. I said building material might be um, quite an important choice as to uh, the function of the building, or it might have, in this instance, a sentimental uh, reason for it being chosen. This is a paper house. Uh, Elias Stenman uh, had it built for him. Uh, Elias Stenman made all of his money uh, because he patented the machine that makes paper clips. So there may be a reason why he chose paper for this unusual structure. Um, and you can see that you, when you're working with building materials, you may come across buildings that have multiple different kinds. And in that instance, you'll need to think of multiple different ways to describe it. Uh, the brickwork, for example, will require you to understand bonding materials, bonding styles, uh, the kinds of brickworks that are being used, the colour of brickwork at work and how those are being used in patterns. Whereas the timber has its own uh, entire uh, uh, lexicon as well. And you just don't have time to get into them, but I will, I've already plugged Rice's arch uh, architectural primer, but if you want to get into it in a heavy way, I can fully recommend uh, Pevner's Architectural Glossary. This has every architectural term, every historical one you could possibly want, and is invaluable. And you can see that there are many place markers here, as it is a well-thumbed term in this household. Um, the choice of building material might be for architectural purposes. They want to make the stone stand out against the red brickwork here so that you can see all of the choices 
uh, that they've made and they've made a lot of choices on the front of this building uh, they've put on pretty much every uh, flourish you could imagine uh, and they want you to they want to be absolutely sure that you see all of them um, or the choice of building material might let you do some architectural forms that were not possible previously like these big square buildings which I find personally very beautiful and many people then look at me strangely and walk away during the party um, and these are some of the clues that you can have for phasing. Uh, symmetry, if things look the same in, in two different parts you can pretty much say that they were probably built at the same time using similar architects, similar uh, goals. Uh, so whilst things like the front of this building at Wells Cathedral was built in the 13th century, the towers being a later addition, which you'll see from other elements of it and how the walls interact, they match each other. So whilst they don't touch, you can start, you can understand that they were probably uh, chosen to be constructed at the same time, giving you that symmetrical front to the building. So even if features are not having a physical connection, if they have a stylistic or form um, share that similarity, it can start to help you understand larger phasings around the structure. Uh, straight joints are a lovely way of making sure that you can see what happens between you know the different phases. If one wall abuts onto this one, one of them has to have been here first before the next one is built. And it particularly helps if, like here at uh, Wimple uh, House, uh, they have ended each uh, part of the construction with something called coins, uh, which are those sort of dog tooth things you can see at the edge of the building there that I've highlighted with the arrows. Uh, those are usually put at the angles of buildings to denote that the wall has ended. And obviously they have then subsequently built wings on the structure, which you can see as symmetrical, so probably built at the same time as each other. And they have continued out from the coins, put another set of coins on, and then built another section to the wings where you can see the points at which the coins end. Um, also worth noting is that if you understand classical architecture, you would expect that frontage of the main building to be quite clean, uh, to possibly have um, uh, like a pediment sitting, uh, sitting um, uh, out from it about, <coughs> sorry, uh, first floor height, but nothing like this, um, uh, this bay window or this uh, section of bay that you have here. Um, and if you can see, it's very hard to see in this particular picture, but when you get up close, the string course, which is that line behind, does not match the string course on the tower. And that's how you can say that this part of the building is a later addition. In fact, it's Victorian and it is, mm, I don't care for it. Uh, blocked openings and brickwork. You can see in this image here that there are two blocked openings and the entire top of the building has been rebuilt. So there are four different phases of, uh, visible here. Uh, sometimes, as with the one towards the right of the screen, the frame or the, uh, the threshold have been left in or with the doorway to the left of the screen, it's been completely removed. Um, you can also see historical context of architectural decisions. For example, here's another block doorway with a large arch or uh, a parade of arches in front of it. And the reason for this was that that was an entrance way into someone's house, which was subsequently blocked up following a French raid of 1338 because it was decided that city walls were more important than people's personal freedoms to have a door. Um, date plaques are great. If you don't mind being uh, led astray every now and again, they are not good evidence all on their own. Do not trust a date plate. They can be moved and put on new buildings. There's a whole architectural uh, um, style called um, arts and crafts, uh, which ruins name plates forever because they use a lot of salvage material to make it look proper old worldy. And um, so I've recorded buildings which have name plates, um, date plates on them. One on the front, one on the back, both entirely different dates, both from not the structure that I was recording. So don't in, always trust them. Um, like this one, for example. Uh, don't always trust one side of the building. Even when you do do it from street view, you might get uh, tricked. Like, for example, this one here. Um, if you just recorded that front, uh, you'd probably say that you've got a, a Strawberry Hill Gothic kind of 18th century uh, front. And you'd be right. Unfortunately, it's a much older structure behind and they've only designed, decided to update one part of it. So, it, yeah, street view is fun, 
going to see the buildings even more fun. And sometimes it can be entirely made up, like for example, this structure, which is made from material from an older building, but is a folly. Uh, and you can tell that's a folly because sometimes you have to know how some buildings work. And I know that if that was a castle I was trying to defend, if I was stood in front of those arrow slits on the ground floor, I'd be very, very easy to murder. Um, so not an effective castle. And, and it helps to understand the history of these buildings that you're working with. Um, not got time for all of this, but suffice to say that windows have a fascinating history, as do bricks. Certainly these do. Um, and there's a lot of recording methods you can use. We've just been discussing uh, written descriptions here because those are the ones that you can do to what's around you. Uh, Photography is quite easy. We've all got uh, phones in our pockets with our mobile phones. Take photographs of it, record what you can see. Um, if you wanted to go into slightly more detail, if you actually wanted to do a proper survey, you would look at things like doing drawings, uh, possibly laser scanning, um, creating 3D images, which you can do um, using digital photography. Um, uh, it's something called photogrammetry. Uh, every time you take a digital image, uh, it records a lot of information, including how long the light takes to get back to the camera. And it, <clears throat> if you use a very fancy piece of equipment, you can just taking photographs go around a building, it stitches it all together and it creates a 3D image. If you'd like to see some of those, uh, go to the website Sketchfab and look for Mola's uh, particular page on there. And there's lots of examples of these 3D models, um, including one of Canon's Ashby, uh, which is one of the buildings I showed you earlier. Um, the drawings that you could do, there's lots of different kinds. This one has been done with a, a line level and a tape measure and literally centimeter by centimeter, measuring every single point on the face of the building and then eventually you feed that into a computer and you create something like this in a CAD. Uh, sectional drawings through the middle. Uh, it helps you show the interactions of different rooms, particularly in things like this, which is a pumping house. So you want to know how the entire structure works together because the whole building is there for a single purpose and the uh, machinery operated through different elements of the building. So a cross section can help you understand that. Uh, phase plans to see different elements, you know, in this instance, this structure had medieval, um, uh, post-medieval, early, modern, lots of different elements of it. And it can get a little bit fuzzy in your head if you just have it written down. This is a nice visual way of putting those elements together so you can understand how the building has developed. Photography, as I say, uh, important to do. And people are like, well, if you've got photography, why do you do drawings? Uh, because photography doesn't get things like this. You look at that photograph and you look at the drawing below, the amount of information that's on that drawing vastly outweighs what you can actually get in the angles of some of these buildings. They can be too tight sometimes. And if any of you have access to a laser scan like that at home, well done, you're very rich. Um, but they are useful. Um, if you are doing something like a community uh, activity, you can work in with organisations who have access to these. And I can tell you they're amazing because they save you a lot of time. Look, things like this curved structure, for example, uh, you can either draw that by hand, and I can guarantee you have a very warped picture at the end of it because you've had to keep moving your line level, or you can let a laser scanner do it and you'll have a much more accurate drawing. Now, I've shot through an overview of historic buildings there. I hope you got an idea at the core of why we do it and what it is. And if you do have any more questions now, this is obviously the question and answer section of it. Um, but I would recommend any of those books that I, I said, to, if you want to go into more detail with it, it's a huge topic. It's, it's like learning a whole new language. But once you do, it's really worthwhile because it lets you appreciate your built environment and the streets that you walk down every day to a whole new level. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, I'm willing to take any questions now. Uh, thanks, Bob. That was great. Really interesting. Uh, could you just say the names of the books you recommended again? I absolutely can. Um, they are Rice's Architectural Primer mm -hmm. and Pevner's Architectural Glossary. Okay. Pevner is sort of like the granddaddy of historical buildings. Uh, 
you'll see, if you ever see one of his uh, guides to regional historical buildings in a charity shop, um, get it. Absolutely get it. They are an invaluable, invaluable resource and they were created by a wonderful uh, madman who would drive around in a two-seat sports car and occasionally uh, just write what he could see as they were whizzing past. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'm inspired to have a look at these books and try to learn more. I remember when I learned the difference between the different types of columns, it provides you with a surprising amount of entertainment, just like riding around the bus and I'm like, oh, not the dark. <laughs> uh, so see, yeah, feel free, anyone, to put in your questions uh, in a few extra minutes to uh, Mark. Um, so, yes, is the degree of recess of the sash window an indicator of age? Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, it's actually, it's quite an interesting, the interplay, uh, right, <laughs> in London, particularly, uh, windows are a really interesting way of getting the age of a building, and not just the windows, but their windowsills. Uh, windowsills were basically uh, introduced post-Great Fire uh, as a, a requirement of having it recessed a certain distance and having a, a a projecting windowsill as a fire prevention technique. The idea being if you have a sill uh, here, as the fires are licking up outside of the building, it struggles to get over the top and can't light the, the timber on fire. And that's so that if you see something with one of those very large projecting windowsill, um, you have a post great fire structure. Um, then uh, subsequently, uh, there was another piece of legislation towards the end of the 18th century that said, that's all well and good with fire going this way, but if fire spreads laterally, we need something for that. So they actually required that uh, the timber work of the window be enclosed within the brickwork. So again, you've got this sort of like bracketing to show the ages of the buildings. If you've got a nice wide uh, windowsill, uh, and, but you can see all of the window on the outside, that's sort of um, uh, late uh, 17th century uh, to late 18th century and then if you've enclosed all of the uh, timber work that's late 18th century onwards. Um, Doug asks, would you investigate the name of the building as an indicator? Yeah absolutely, you'd look at all different elements of it, um, you know the the name of the building can be either from the architect, from the use of it, from just which road it's near and all that kind of things. Mm -hmm. But it's every opportunity to learn more about the structure is an avenue worth investigating. You know, if I if it's called Murder House and I'm like, that's nah, probably a nunnery, I'm probably not doing my job very well. <laughs> um, someone asked. Ask, would you have anything interesting to say about chimney pots? More than we've got time for. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> the answer is yeah. Like, uh, go to Hampton Court Palace and, and stare in wonder at some of the finest uh, twisted chimney pots in, in, in England. <laughs> so uh, we need another webinar just to go into chimney pots. You need another webinar to go into bricks. Just bricks. <laughs> Okay, um, do we have any other questions? Last opportunity for questions. As uh, Sanja asks about a link to the recording, it'll be on our YouTube channel. So if you just search YouTube uh, Layers of London, you'll get there and it'll be up sometime tomorrow or the weekend. Hopefully tomorrow. And then someone has shared a list to Mola's 3D models on Sketchfab and it's interested. Uh, so have a look in the chat. If Interest you and any some Philip asks any software recommended for recording? Um, you don't need any sort of fancy equipment to be honest with you. Um, I, I think the most high tech piece of equipment I'd take on a, any recording when you're actually out there is is a, a laser measure which you can get from pretty much any sort of hardware store, software wise, like the things that we do with the, the laser scanning and the, the photogrammetry is, it's, it's grand and it's, an, it's a nice way of recording, but you can do everything you need to with drawings, photography and written descriptions. Uh, and one last question from Ewan, you may not have the answer. 
how do you deal with the depression of seeing so many badly built buildings in one area? <laughs> By enjoying mourning about them. <laughs> uh, one last question. Okay. How can you get involved in this on an amateur level? At the very basic thing you could just go and do it to be honest no one's stopping you from uh visiting these buildings and doing recording work like this um i would rec I, I would genuinely start by looking at your own home even if it's quite a modern one you can do things like map regressions using layers of london to understand the context of the building that you live in um you you know you can visit archives to see if there's any historical photographs uh, things like um uh, the lma if you're in london I and mean, this is very london centric because it's where i work um but if you get to the lma they have something called collage which has a lot of historical images on there and you can just start by you know building it up and once you get beyond that kind of level of things there um we occasionally run projects, so keep your eyes on Mola. Uh, there'll be various uh, odds and sods out there for people to get involved with. We don't have anything at the moment, but we're trying to work on a few things. Uh, so eyes on the web page. But other than that, uh, sorry, is that LMA in there? London Metropolitan Archive? Someone's asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. London Metropolitan Archive. Yes, good. Um, but yeah, go out. I mean, you, you, live, you live in a building, you're surrounded by them. Go and have a look. Great. And on that note, uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you very much again, Paul. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I want to see it again. Um, it'll be up on our YouTube channel at some point tomorrow afternoon. And lots of people saying thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to myself. Um, <laughs> bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.